Well, hello everyone and welcome to Unified Workspace Community and a little talk through on endpoint security today. And why is this important? Well, let me preface this first by saying that endpoint security is essential for a modern IT environment. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And we're gonna get into this as we go further through. So one of the things we've noticed is that security really has been game changing. Let me start over, okay? I'm not, I'm not doing, so let me start from the beginning again. And I'm gonna turn my fan on, so I've got that, okay? No, no worries. Okay. Hello everyone, and welcome to Endpoint Security, a little presentation we're doing within the Unified Workspace community. So thank you all for sitting in with us today, and hopefully we're gonna take you through some pretty interesting material that's relevant to your organizations. So I wanna preface it first by talking about the fact that endpoint security really is essential for a modern IT environment. If you're not currently really focusing on endpoint security, I know you will be, but I believe most of the people here already take this pretty seriously. And why? Because the cloud. Cloud really has been game changing for business productivity, but it comes with a cost. Remote work, unfortunately opened organizations up for more cyber attacks. And these threats are getting more sophisticated by the day. And as more devices, more users outside corporate networks are there, are, are working outside of the, what we used to think of as the internet or the walls or organizations, an attack unfortunately can become inevitable. So how can security and IT professionals help prepare their organizations for this worst case scenario? Well, what we maintain is you start with secure devices. So my name is Amy Price. I work in the software and experiences group. I'm a team lead from product marketing at Dell. And I'm the portfolio evangelist for cybersecurity and endpoint management. A little bit about me, those that know me outside of my work actually see me as a professional live music photographer. And I also write um, do write and do music journalism, but a lot of people look at me as sort of the idea hamster. I'm the one that's always seems to be my little idea wheel is constantly turning. So if you spend a little bit of time with me, you'll probably know that. So let's talk a little bit about the reasons that this environment is changing. And it's because there are new attack vectors. And so what ends up happening is those surfaces that they used to go after are now being hardened, so attackers are looking for softer targets. So two classifications of attackers we really deal with, the nation states, where their level of attack is highly sophisticated. Some of these attacks take long times to do. They are actually preying upon vulnerabilities that exist in software called zero days. Those are very highly targeted, often going after infrastructure to destroy uh, and cripple a country's economy or to exfiltrate key data. And that what we're also seeing in the second classification of, of attackers, the more common criminals, these guys are looking for money, sometimes just there to do, uh, just there to do damage. But ransomware and ransomware as a service, this is actually another thing that particularly SMBs and organizations are seeing. And what we've learned really in the past year is that this threat landscape, it's always been growing and evolving, is really taking advantage of vulnerabilities caused by changes in the workplace dynamic with people working from home. So according to research that was conducted on behalf of VMware Carbon Black, there's a 148% spike in ransomware attacks on global organizations. And this really came about because of COVID-19, people going remote. And you really don't have to follow the news to understand that these attacks really are spiking. And these are the ones we hear about. And then the second thing is that there's a 1.3 times year over year uptick in confirmed data breaches in 2022. Again, these are the ones we hear about. And because I mentioned remote work, that is intensifying the complexity of dealing with this cybercrime, where 84% of leaders represent report data loss prevention is more challenging with a remote work environment. And then 48% of employees say they're less likely to follow safe data practices when working from home or wherever. And that should give you a feel for this perfect storm, which seems to be emerging around cyber attacks to the point where ESG said that 69% 
organizations have experienced some type of cyber attack as the result of a poorly managed internet facing asset. So one example I would give to you, and that is the Equifax situation that happened a few years ago. So for instance, someone misconfigured a server and they were told by their IT department to fix it and address it. They didn't. And about well, four weeks or so later, a cyber criminal found out about it. So we talked about servers, however, endpoints continue to be expanding and they are a very primary primo attack surface. If you look at these nine points in here, the majority of these actually are related to endpoints. So this is from the MITRE attack framework. And these nine initial access techniques, I'm gonna call out just a few of these. unsafe hardware, supply chain compromise, and social engineering. So for instance, you think unsafe hardware. Okay, right, is that happening? But one industry research report conducted by Futurum in 2020 noted that 44% of organizations have had at least one hardware level or BIOS attack during the preceding 12 months. That's kind of big. In supply chain, it's responsible for 62% of network breaches this year. And that's from the Verizon DBIR report. And that 82% of breaches were driven by individual error related to social engineering attacks, such as phishing. So these are real statistics, real information and gathered and compiled here. These are real threats that you need to be aware of that are related specifically to endpoint. And the attack targets and the reasons are the things that we're hearing about from organizations because of this complexity and the number of things that are happening, we're not, organizations are really not sure what to do. It's constantly shifting and changing. So cyber complexities, you know, more configurations, more opportunity for disruption because networks and devices are more interdependent and connected. So for instance, Ukraine used to be sort of Russia's way to be able to test could take down a utility grid. And what Ukraine re realized is if they go into resilient, they go and make their networks more resilient, that they actually can begin to section off and disconnect portions of the network that allows them to continue on. So learning from cyber complexities, hardware threats, so counterfeit parts, tainted parts, components that are inserted, these cause threats because it's the sheer number of devices with smarts and connectivity increases, so does this possibility of having a vulnerability. In supply chain IT globalization, and a lot of the countries we get parts from these days or your parts come from, um, does unfortunately potentially have something comes from an unfriendly country. And that this globalization means that every business and every nation becomes more dependent on others to provide these components that are critical for their operations. And some of the places like China, they're not all that friendly to Western organizations, but we still have to figure out how to get what's needed by minimizing the risk. Software threats, these really are among the worst of threats since this is the source of many of these vulnerabilities. It could be intentional, like an insider threat, like someone inserting subtle and malicious code into a program, or it could be totally unintentional, such as bugs, or it could be things like the counterfeit certificates we saw in the solar winds attacks. But these are still threats, and this is a dynamic environment. And then finally, regulation risks show that well-intentioned people can still muck things up, especially when you have regulations that are, are specific on critical industries and compliance policies and controls that not only are behind the ball and behind where the market is, but they end up conflicting with each other. These are all things that exist. So a few developments which have really impacted cybersecurity, certainly apart from the attacks themselves, we have to consider these like worldwide events such as COVID and threats and attacks on government response and the government's response. These are now accelerating the demand for zero trust for SASE technologies, as well as for managed security services. Customers want trusted technology and security partners, not product pushers. This is something we hear pretty clearly in our conversations with organizations. There are many people participating in cybersecurity and in zero trust in particular. If I take zero trust as a case, 
organizations will tell you, yeah, we have solutions for zero trust, but then you find out that you have to get it all from them, or you have to be really limited in the way in which you can integrate components you currently have in your environment. So unfortunately, this leaves the bag in the hands of the organization who's trying to implement zero trust using a bag of parts that no, don't always work together. In I in June 2021, IDC validated something that we had been talking about for years, about the breadth and the depth of endpoint security, including built-in security, hardware-based, as well as security in the supply chain. And then this report really did validate it. We've had industry analysts as late as 2019 tell us, you know, they didn't really look at supply chain because their customers weren't asking about it. But IDC's report validated that we were on the right track all along. And we also know from the news about high profile successful attacks, such as, uh, for instance, on healthcare, financial services, energy, nuclear uh, facilities, and manufacturing and food suppliers. So for instance, the Colonial Pipeline attack was a recent one. And these attacks not only are about money, they cause havoc, they impact lives, and it's causing governments to take action and protect certain segments, which is great. But the other thing to remember is that in this events-driven world we live in, that as one target hardens, the attackers just move to targets that are softer. The same way you would if a, if a person was trying to break into your house and you had a brand new shiny lock on the front door and cameras, they're going to find someplace else to come in. So you have to consider that as you lock up one, they're going to go to other targets. And an example of this, SMB. So the small, medium businesses, 47% of them have experienced a ransomware attack compared to 54% of larger organizations. And as each of these sectors are hardened and protected, the attackers will move on to softer targets. They're not always nation states, but they're often well-funded attackers. Sometimes they want money, but sometimes it's just people being picked people and they're not going to stop trying to cause havoc. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that everyone's vulnerable. All organizations are vulnerable, that a hack is going to be inevitable, an attack is going to be inevitable. So people who talk about the fact that they build defensive networks for a living, they've come to this reality to understand that if somebody really wants in, they're gonna make it in. They have a high probability of actually being successful. So what your job is actually to do is to make this less of an issue for yourself. And the cost of getting it wrong is crippling. So your data, average data breach, when you look just at direct costs, is like 4.35 million US dollars in 2022. This is significant money and it can cripple smaller companies. So what needs to change going forward? And a lot of this is that our approach to security for years has been castle and moat. So we put up a huge wall and put a moat around it. We had boiling oil ready to pour down or anyone who wanted to storm the castle walls and archers ready to shoot arrows at attackers as they came. But what we found is that th this type of castle and moat security of securing the outside and only really securing the outside no longer works. And why is this? This is actually a move towards zero trust. And this is because traditional security was very siloed. And for, for a organization to really have effective security to posture, they actually have to look at endpoint workload, identity, network, and cloud. You need to look at all five points. So the ultimate goal, obviously, is to, is to protect applications and the data. And this modern security approach of looking at these five points as a way of protecting applications and data uh, is the more modern security approach, and it allows greater control. Now, this also puts you in a situation for a remote and hybrid work environment because people are outside of the organization. It creates that larger attack surface. And, but this type, of an, a, a, this type of an approach by adopting a more perimeter, not so much a perimeter based approach, but a situation where um, you're actually protecting the assets within is actually much more effective. 
And largely it's because as people are working outside the organization, the perimeter has been blurred. So today, for instance, devices have more sensitive documents stored on them and traversing through them than ever before with employees working from anywhere. You know, they could be at home or coffee shop or hotel using public Wi-Fi, and they have limited to no connectivity back to some firewall protected offices and data centers. So they're not backhauling traffic via VPN. They're not going VPNing to their office or on-premise, and that that default is often a direct connection from their devices out to the internet. Now, given this nature of this hybrid architecture, organizations, you can't eliminate the perimeters, but what you can do is begin to establish a situation where you're, you are not assuming that inherent trust is there, you're assuming zero trust, where you're trusting nothing. So this defense in depth, still very important, but we have to move on from hardening that infrastructure for building those big walls and putting a big moat in to thinking about protecting data assets and access from within. That's where zero trust comes in. So what is it? So according to the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, which we refer to as NIST, their definition is that it's an evolving set of cybersecurity paradigms, paradigms being organizational structures, uh, and, and constructs that really move defenses from static network-based perimeters, the castle and moat, to focus on users, assets, and resources. So unpacking this definition, it's a new way of thinking about security by bringing explicit control to the IT environment. Because legacy approaches, the castle and moat traditionally assumed implicit control. So after your identify identity when a network is established, you were given you know, reign to go wherever you needed to. But now to get today with most enterprise web traffic going through the cloud and organizations moving to these hybrid flexible work models, identity is becoming a blind spot. And so with identity compromise being the element, unfortunately in the majority of breaches. So if we apply the principles of zero trust to the endpoints, first, no implicit trust is granted. Zero trust requires a th authorization on every single access. And zero trust, as its name implies, assumes the worst case always. So ultimately, though, these principles mean that zero trust requires authorization on every single access and continuous authentication to grant additional access, but all the while monitoring for and addressing odd behaviors. So think about this in terms of your users. Your users are used to coming in and not really being restricted on what they do. What we need to do as IT professionals is as we roll out zero trust to consider how users will work within this. They're not gonna wait 20 minutes to be able to grant access to specific, specific database or cloud access uh, point that they need. They're gonna want to move seamlessly through it. And that's back to how you determine how you're going to go forward with zero trust. But let's illustrate this a little bit with what we think of with, with um, physical security. So for instance, you work at a corporate job in a, high, in a high rise building in Midtown Manhattan. And before you were hired, your HR department, they did a background check. They may even check your credit to find out how good a person you were, so to speak. And upon hiring, you received a name badge, access key and a key fob. And then HR told you what the security protocols in the building and you followed them ever since. So every morning you walk in the front door of the high rise building in Midtown Manhattan and security cameras are positioned everywhere. And you pull out your badge and you badge in to get into the turnstile next to the security guards. And then you badge in to get into the elevator and punch your floor to gain access to it. And then once you step out on your floor, you head towards the glass doors of your office suite, which may be one of two suites on that floor. And at the door, you again swipe your ID for access to that suite and pass by the front desk. And once you sit at your workstation, you unlock that computer with a thumbprint or a, or a password. So this sounds pretty familiar, right? Well, your employer identified you on day one and every access you've requested since then has been authenticated and continuously verified to protect the resources and the acts and the assets of the organization, users, data, application services, workflows, accounts, et cetera. And for additional layer of security, you know what? You've got security guards and cameras that you passed. They're watching your movement and building on monitors. So you now 
any odd behavior. So for instance, you vary from what would be accepted for an employee who's doing your job and you end up in the executive suite going through a file cabinet, those are monitored and your badge then can be logged when you're trying to access a floor or suite you shouldn't be. This is noted, investigated. This is really how zero trust works, where there's author authorization on every single access point with continuous authentication to grant additional access and all the while monitoring for and addressing any odd behaviors. But as you see from this physical model, this really isn't that much different from the way in which people normally live. So what you're going to do is to see people continue to go across and around their normal operations as they, as they move forward. So again, zero trust may somehow seem like it's gonna really change the way your employees work, but when you're doing it right, it doesn't, and it will be, give far greater control over uh, to key uh, capabilities, assets, data within your organization. So the way we look at endpoint security is that this is an essential part of a zero trust situation. So you want to start with secure devices that you know are going to be trustworthy, trust enabled, because this is going to be the source of your identity. This is where your employees first connect into your system. And then the secondly, you're going to want to monitor all the activities. It's going to require a holistic approach to endpoint security with very strict policies and control. Remember, no implicit trust is granted, only minimum access is granted. And then finally, it assumes the worst case scenario always. I'm sounding like doom and gloom here, but the truth is that when this is executed in your environment, your employees are not going to really see any difference in the way in which things work. And in fact, you could actually begin to make more things available to them because you're in a situation where you have better granular control over those access to assets. So what makes a device secure? Well, the first thing really is about having multiple layers of, of defense against evolving threats. So having your devices securely designed in development with a life cycle that essentially lets you know how, uh, the, how the device was made, how the firmware was made, how the software was developed, through uh, how it's delivered to your, to your site, how it's delivered to your employees, so the safe shipping aspects. The security that's built in to trust, to allow you to know that the device is not compromised. And then the software that you use to protect it from advanced threats. And, you know, I talked about the castle and moat and a strong perimeter. In a zero trust environment, you're really beginning to look individually within your organization at your assets, but it does not remove the need to still keep a strong perimeter because threats still come in through the endpoints and you want to catch them before they make their way into the systems. And then finally, to think about this from an ongoing support throughout the PC's life cycle. In the Dell Trusted Workspace, we see endpoint zero trust enabled security must create that firm foundation and allow the ongoing vigilance. And what is Dell Trusted Workspace is a comprehensive defense framework combining hardware and software security technologies. Hardware and firmware-based protections are built into Dell Trusted Devices, which are, which are the industry's most secure commercial PCs. And these protections are offered exclusively on Dell devices. And then there's software-based protections, which we can build into any device in your IT environment. In Dell Trusted Workspace, we build these with built-in hardware and firmware protections. And then we also have built on capabilities with software based protections delivered through the ecosystem. So putting these together, it's a comprehensive approach to ensuring that your endpoints are safe and protected. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so how does Dell Trusted Workspace enable zero trust? Well, Dell Trusted Workspace is really that secure foundation of your modern zero trust ready IT environment. It, because of the defense, defense capabilities we have, it reduces that attack surface using a holistic endpoint strategy, activating the zero trust principles to verify identity and grant only the minimum level of access needed for users, devices, apps, and data, and to monitor and manage unusual behavior. 
And our very coordinated defense-based approach to endpoint security offsets these threats by combining built-in protections with ongoing vigilance. We start with the device with built-in solutions with proprietary hardware and firmware. We also incorporate built-with solutions and built-with capabilities where we're designing our software and selecting our vendors and managing our supply chain with security-centric design and strict standards in the supply chain. What does this do? These two together ensure that the device is safe for first boot. And then on top of that, we have built on capabilities through software-based technology and with our partners that prevent, detect, and respond to threats. And that you can see also how each solution helps to really safeguard the endpoint, such as Dell's safeguard and response and safe data to help businesses identify and address advanced threats across the organization. And then built into the device includes things like Safe ID, which is a dedicated FIPS Level 3 security chip. What does this do? It actually hardware protects user credentials and verifies user access. This is exclusive to Dell, as is Safe BIOS, which has firmware protections to embed in the device to ensure that your device, your device firmware, your device BIOS is actually authentic. It's using off-host verification as well as providing capabilities to detect tampering. And then in the built with features, things like our, our safe supply chain. It's an offer that would allow you to actually validate that PCs are delivered as they as they as they were ordered and to build strict control of the IT environment. Let me start that again. So with built-in features such as the safe supply chain offering would allow you to validate PCs that are delivered as they were ordered using secure component verification, as well as to ensure strict control of the IT environment through a lot of the capabilities we have to actually check and to validate that the devices before they're shipped to you. So to sum all this up, how do you make sure devices are secure? Well, the first thing you do is to keep in mind that you must make security a part of your evaluation process every time you source devices. And that remember that your OEM supply chain is now your supply chain too. So the security they use to build the device is going, to, is going to be your security to ensure that your devices are actually correct and as ordered and shipped without threats. And then finally, or secondly, practice good IT hygiene. Follow the security protocols that are laid out. Set and maintain BIOS passwords. Change those passwords periodically and change them securely. Keep software and firmware up to date. If there's something you take away from this, for sure, understand that keeping software and firmware up to date is one of the things along with passwords is that you can do to really protect your devices. And finally, from your user perspective, use multi-factor authentication. If you're not using it now, you need to be in not only your professional life, but your personal life. And then finally, use threat detection and prevention software you still have to maintain a strong perimeter to defend against threats. Oh, and by the way, I have one more. Train your users. So to have your users understand threats like ransomware and phishing. Train them to not just click on random documents that come in. Run tests so that they remain vigilant. And then if they fail those tests, that they go and they get uh, additional training. And even cybersecurity people sometimes do fail the tests. And by the way, your training could also extend to social engineering. There's a new thing going around, particularly in the senior community, we call pig butchering. And what they're doing essentially is a cyber criminal will use a cyber means to reach out to an individual and essentially fatten them up by getting them to start transferring money to them. These are old cons, but now they're using cyber means to get into them. Train your users. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. So please visit us at dell.com slash endpoint security to learn more. Email us as you need, endpoint security at dell.com and do follow us in the socials, LinkedIn on Dell Technologies as well as Twitter at Dell Tech. And thank you very much for your time today. And we really appreciate it.